Okay, so in this video, we're gonna cover nuclear stability. So in the previous video, we looked at the different types of ways that an, a, an, a nucleus can um, emit or absorb particles to stabilize itself, to get itself um, into a more stable configuration. So the question becomes, what defines a stable configuration in a nucleus? What holds the nucleus together? And then what would make a nucleus unstable? So the first question is, is what, what holds a nucleus together? Right? Because what we have is we basically have, um, with a hydrogen atom, we only have one proton. So that's, that's sort of no big deal. Um, one proton can be on its own. But then when we start to put two or three protons together, there's going to be a repulsion. So, the, uh, so multiple protons will repel each other. So then the question is, is, well, what holds these positive charges together in a very, very small space? Remember, the nucleus of the entire volume of the atom, the nucleus represents a very, very tiny fraction of the entire volume of an atom. So these, these subatomic particles are not only being held together, they're being held together in a very, very, very dense uh, arrangement. The packing is very, very tight. So the answer to this question is the strong nuclear force. Uh, the nuclear force is one of the strong forces in the universe, and it's basically a strong attraction of nucleons at very short distances. And um, the distances that we're talking about are on the order of 10 to the minus 15th meters. So these are tiny distances, even less than a picometer. So um, this is what overcomes the repulsion. So, so you, what you need is you need to have, um, you need to have for as you add more and more protons, you need to have more and more neutrons because what winds up happening is, is the protons repel each other. They have some attractive, they have their, the strong force attracting them together, but you need something that's not charged, like a neutron, which is also a subatomic particle in there, to hold those protons together in addition to the strong force from just the protons alone. So um, this is sort of similar to atomic trends. And something that's really important in determining stability is the neutron to proton ratio. Uh, this is the n over z ratio, where n is the number of neutrons and z is the number of protons. And like I said, what we expect is that, you know, when there are relatively few numbers of protons, we just need a, uh, the same number of neutrons to hold it together. So let's take a look at this chart, which shows um, this, this chart is going to be very, very important in understanding stability. So down here at very low atomic numbers, when we have Z less than 20, um, these are ones where we have relatively few protons in the nucleus, up to 20 protons. What we find is that the, the stable isotopes tend to, tend to congregate around the one to one ratio. So the N over Z ratio is approximately equal to one. And in almost all cases under um, with Z less than 20, the N over Z ratio is one. So um, that, that's something that we see. Now, what, what you're looking at in this chart is this chart is plotting the number of protons. So this is the atomic number and then the number of neutrons. So when it's one to one, we get a slope equal to one. Basically, uh, as you get to 100 protons, there's 100 neutrons. So in low atomic numbers, this band of stability that forms, um, which is shown here. So these black dots are the isotopes that are stable. And then the sort of reddish dots are the isotopes that aren't stable. So the reason why we call this the band of stability is because the, the, these, this line that's kind of going through here, those are the stable isotopes. 
So we're going to try to explain why this band does what it does. So now when you get above z over 20, this band departs the one-to-one -one ratio and it takes on a new slope. So from z is that's greater than 20, but less than about 80, 80 or so, um, the n to z ratio goes up to about 1.5. So what happens is is there's some at some point in the in this band and it, it happens at around 20 you start to get enough protons in there that you the glue holding it together the neutrons one neutron is not enough to hold those protons together anymore you start to need exp you start to need an increasing number of neutrons relative to protons and that goes up to about 1.5 um and then we continue on through the band of stability and we keep tending to move up toward this 1.5 when it doesn't tend it doesn't go above the 1.5 but it, it kind of gradually approaches it it kind of starts with one to one and then as it departs it goes up to like 1.1 1.2 1.3 and then by the time we get up to about 80 we're at about 1.5 meaning um, we need about 50 percent more neutrons than we have protons to keep everything together and this is all due to that increased repulsion and then what happens is, is when we get oh, when we get into z greater than eighty three, um, there's just no the proton to proton uh, repulsion is so high that basically there's no number of neutrons that are going to hold it together. Um, so uh, it's so high that no stable isotope can exist. So above 83, you start to see all of the isotopes become um, this range up here. These become unstable. Okay, so let's look at what tends to happen and where. So if, if we kind of start down here in the one-to-one -one ratio, if we move into this region where we go on this side of the band, um, what we're doing here is we're going into the region where we have too many protons. Relative to neutrons. So if we have too many protons, we need to we need to do we need to have decay modes that will convert a proton to a neutron. Um, so over here, you could see like, let's just pick a point here. Let's say that we had an isotope that was right here. This would be an extreme isotope but it, would, it could be one. This one would have 20 protons, but only 10 neutrons. So this one would have way too many protons relative to the number of neutrons. It would have to get rid of some of the protons. So the two possible modes for this are electron capture and positron emission. Um, we need to convert protons to neutrons, and those are the two that will do that. Now, it's difficult to predict which one of those two will happen. So on an exam, in a multiple choice, for example, we would give you an element. You'd have to calculate the n to z ratio. If the n to z ratio was too low, meaning you had too many protons to neutrons, then um, you would know that you would be doing either an electron capture or a positron emission. Now, we wouldn't put both of these in the multiple choice. There would just be one, and then you would have to pick that one. That would be the best. The wrong answers would be things like beta emission, uh, alpha emission, or things like that. So um, you'd be choosing uh, one that made sense uh, of these two. You should know how to write both of those, but in terms of predicting, you don't have to necessarily predict whether one or the other will happen. So uh, the n over z ratio here is too low. Okay, so now let's go on the other side. Let's say that we go from a stable position and we go up to here, let's say. So let's pick, um, let's pick a point right here uh, at the 2010. So in this band, what we have is we wind up having too many neutrons if we go above the curve. So in this case, our n to z ratio is too high. So the best thing to do over here is a beta emission. A beta emission converts a proton 
I am sorry, it converts a neutron to a proton. So we get rid of some of those excess neutrons and we go to a proton. Okay, now when we get up into the unstable range, up here in the um, Z above 83, these things are going to tend to prefer alpha emission because alpha emission is the, this is the most efficient way to get rid of nucleons. So if the, if the element doesn't um, have a fission event, meaning um, if it doesn't just break apart into two other nuclei, uh, and it, the only thing it can do is just spit out um, particles, alpha emission is the most efficient to do that because it gets rid of the most number of protons and neutrons at, in one event. So we tend to see alpha emission above Z is greater than 83. Um, typically, in order to get something to fission, you need to have something else that kind of impacts the nucleus. So typically fissions are, uh, I wouldn't say catalyzed, but are started by uh, another subatomic particle that comes in like a neutron, which just throws everything off and causes the nucleus to break apart. But if it doesn't have that neutron coming in, then alpha emission is, is the way it will go in terms of getting rid of these subatomic particles. So this gives an introduction to, um, this gives an introduction to uh, the types of decay. And now we're gonna look at two examples of decay and predicting what the products will be.